Good morning and welcome to the Indiana University Kelly School of Business's Worldwide Roundtable in this new semester and new year. My name is LaVon Schlegel and I'm the Executive Director of the Institute for International Business here at the Kelly School. Thank you all for joining us this morning as we continue our third series in our third series of the Worldwide Roundtables. Hearing from distinguished speakers in Europe, ASEAN, specifically Indonesia and Thailand, and Mexico, Latin America, all gathering to explore the idea of shared value in business. As always, it takes a global team to put together these events. I would like to thank Jen Goins and Allison DeWitt from Kelly's Office of Development Engagement, Roy Hooper from the IU Alumni Association, Peter Brunjarin from the IU ASEAN Gateway, Molly Fisher and Lucero Gillian at the IU Mexico Gateway, Andrea Adam Moore at the IU Europe Gateway, and Ali Batten, Director of the IU Global Gateways. I also want to thank Rob Clindening, Rebecca Salerno, and George Lahakis from Kelly Marketing, Jeff Poland at IIB, and finally, I would like to thank Tim Smith, also from IIB, without whom this project would not have happened. As I mentioned, today's discussions will explore the idea of shared value in business. In three very different sessions, we look at what shared value is in the traditional sense of the word, but also how business should see their shared responsibility and what has become a very interconnected world. No longer should any business leader live in the vacuum of not understanding the broader impact of their business choices and decisions. They should want to make sure they are more than just good, good caretakers of their business, but also make a positive contribution to their communities, large and small. With so many business leaders taking on this challenge, the ways in which they make positive contribution are many, both socially and economically. Each panel in this series takes a different look at the topic and explores the impact business is having on what is unmistakably a much smaller and more interrelated world. I am pleased to introduce today's moderator, Professor Timothy Fort. Tim holds the Evole Professorship in Business Ethics and is Professor of Business Law and Ethics at the Kelly School of Business here at Indiana University. He received his bachelor's and master's of arts from the University of Notre Dame and his PhD in JD from Northwestern University. He has taught at the University of Michigan and at George Washington University. Tim has written more than 80 articles in 15 books. He has edited an additional 23 books. Two of his books have won the Best Book Award from the Academy of Management for Social Issues. He has won 12 research awards from three different academic associations and has served on editorial boards of the flagship journals of each of these associations. He has won five teaching awards and has served as academic director for a unique program for players from the NFL. He has also taught a course with then Federal Reserve Chair Ben Bernanke. He served as director of an institute, as department chair, and as an interim associate dean. He has been a coach and consultant for Alexandra Countess of Fredericksburg, Denmark, in her, in her role as a member of the Board of Directors of Faring Pharmaceuticals. Tim's primary research interest concerns how ethical business conduct can create a positive organizational culture, which in turn fosters sustainable peace. He co-chaired a task force on the topic with the U.S. Institute of Peace and helped to develop a program with the U.S. State Department where MBA students served as pro bono consultants to entrepreneurs in conflict-sensitive zones. He has extended that work to music, sports, and film to create a research stream of cultural foundations of peace where cultural artifacts serve as a nudge to make ethical decisions and to provide common ground for individuals who might otherwise disagree on social issues. In that regard, he has organized multiple conferences with faculty from the Jacobs School of Music, co-edited a book, written two articles, and organized a film series with the IU Cinema. His pre-tenure work on how business can be mediating institutions is drawn from natural law and from bioanthropology 
integrating leading theories of business ethics and emphasizes optimal corporate culture. Tim, thank you for serving as today's moderator and thank you to our panelists for your contributions and participation in this important global discussion. Thank you, Levon, for that introduction and welcome to everyone for Kelly's third worldwide roundtable discussion on the topic of shared values. I do have to say that while I thank Levon for that introduction, she has made a mistake. It's not a mistake factually, it's a mistake in judgment in asking me to be the moderator, not just for the panel, but for these three particular panelists. I've known each one of them for at least 15 years. And quite frankly, I could talk about them for the entire hour here. Uh, these are like my three favorite Europeans here. And so it's really a delight for me, not only to welcome them because they're esteemed thought leaders and business leaders and really creative people, but also because I enjoy talking to them. So uh, I'm really enthused about this. Let me one by one go through uh, each one of them and give you a little bit of a background, kind of some formal background, a little bit more of some color background as well. The first person I'd like to introduce is Countess Alexandra. She is the Countess of Fredericksburg in uh, Denmark. She's very active in the business community in, uh, in Denmark and is the founding member of the Prince Nikolai and Prince Felix Foundation, which supports humanitarian culture and higher education causes. Um, she is, uh, has served since 2007 on the board of directors of Faring Pharmaceutical, which is a, a Swiss-based pharmaceutical company with more than 7,000 employees and offices around the world. And in that uh, role as a member of the board of directors, she also serves as the chair of the ethics committee for uh, the board of directors. Uh, she's also extremely active in, in doing uh, patronage work for humanitarian causes in Denmark, ranging from uh, Parkinson's to uh, uh, services for the blind, um, music, animals. It's, it's a wide list. There's about 20, 25 different organizations for which she serves as a, uh, as a patron. Um, she also, and I'm going to have to ask you for a little bit of help here, uh, Countess Alexander, that she is the author of a popular book in Denmark of why Danes are so happy. I won't have any effort or any chance of pronouncing the name. What's the, how do you pronounce the name of the book, Alexander? It's called Mit Lugli Len, which means my happy country. Okay. So she's an author, co-author of that book. She's also a co-author of another book. Uh, the name of the co-author man I, let me think of that oh it's me <laughs> so she and i co-authored a book called the sincerity edge with stanford university press that came out uh, about four years ago uh, or so which was a finalist for a best book award uh, from the academy of management and you'll probably hear a little bit more about that as we get into some of the questions uh, later she also is a bit of an alumnus of the kelly school of business because four years ago she served as the uh, polling shareholder they brought her to campus on two different occasions and she was uh, received extremely enthusiastically and people kept coming can she can she come back you know they were really enthused and so this is nice we haven't been able to get her back uh in person we haven't been able to get a lot of people back in person over the last couple of years so but it's great to have you here today alexander to participate in this program um our second uh guest for today is zahid torres Rahman. Um, who I've also known for about 15 years or so. He's the CEO uh, of a very interesting organization uh, that is kind of double based in Spain and the UK called Business Fights Poverty. Uh, it's a business led collaboration network fo focused on social impact that he and his wife Yvette founded in 2005. Um, I, I just wanna talk about that just for a little bit before I get to the, some of the more formal stuff. This is for any of you who are academics this is just a fabulous site that he has. Uh, what I've worked with him on three, four, at least conferences on business and peace. And when's the, some of the first stuff we did on music business and peace. And any academic will tell you that one of the things that really makes for a great conference is that if you can have kind of small group interaction so people can talk to each other over the course of a conference. The bigger the conference, the harder that is to do. But with Zahid's model, we can have and have had small intimate conferences, but then to kind of replay the highlights for a wider audience. And when I talk about a wider audience, what do you have 25, 30,000 you know, uh, business leaders uh, and managers that are part of your organization now, Zahid? Yeah, it's heading towards 39,000. Yeah, 39,000. Yeah. So one, 
they get exposed and all of that research and, and, and discussion gets exposed, but it's also done in a format so that there is feedback. So academics can try out their ideas and we get feedback of whether we make any sense or not. And it makes a difference in the, the work that we do. And in fact, uh, a couple of books, including that music business and piece that uh, Laban talked about, that was kind of first tried out with Zahid's website. And it just came out in publication as a book about two weeks ago. Um, and it's just a, it's a, just a, terrific, uh, a terrific model. So you can blend a lot of different ways to have discussions that have maximum kind of impact. Anyway, before Business Fights Poverty, uh, Zahid worked in both public and private sectors, including the UK Department for International Development, the UK Treasury, Guyanese Ministry of Finance, and PwC. He started his career as a secondary school teacher in rural Zimbabwe. Uh, he has a master's in philosophy from development studies at Cambridge and a bachelor's in science and economics and politics from the University of Bath. And then our third guest is Per Saxigard. Uh, per is, I'm going to embarrass him when I say this, but what the heck? I mean, all I've said, I've said this to many people, is I think that this guy ought to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. I mean, I really do. I mean, I just think that what he has done of fostering the notion of business and peace is phenomenal. Um, and of course, that's something that I've been writing about for 20 years. And it's great for an academic to write about this stuff, but Per is a businessman. He's an investment banker. He's a, um, an investor, an entrepreneur, has been doing that for 30 years. And so he's a successful businessman. And you know, I, I've taught in business school for 37 years. Investment bankers look at the world through a tough set of lenses. I mean, it is, they look at things really closely. And yet within that scope and within that logic, he has been able to frame ways in which businesses need to be thinking of shared values, or as I'm going to talk a little bit or have Per talk a little bit about a his concept of business worthy, of being successful in business over the long term by expanding a little bit about the concepts of what we are in business about, or maybe not expanding, and maybe it's drilling down to what was this was all about in the first place. So Per founded uh, Business for Peace Foundation back in 2007 that promotes the concepts of being business worthy and recognizing that leadership. So he not only promotes it, but he gives something called the Oslo Award every year, which is recognized business people who have done concrete things in order to advance these ideas of shared values, business and peace and business and being business worthy. And that itself is great so that it's not just esoteric academic, we might be able to do something on this. It's concrete examples of what business people actually are doing. And he is doing that by developing partnerships with business leaders globally, by working with the International Chamber of Commerce, the Principles for Responsible Investment, the UN Development Program, the UN Global uh, Compact. So he works with Nobel laureates in the selection of these people. And so he really is on the ground making very concrete these ideas of shared values and business worthy. One other thing that I would mention about him is that he wrote the foreword for one of my books, one of those that Levon mentioned did win a uh, best book award. He wrote the forward for it. And I've never been quite sure how to take this from my students. I use it in my class and they said, you know, the forward's the best part of the book. And I'm not sure if that's a good thing that they really like the forward or it's like, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't have written it. You should just let Pear write the whole thing. <laughs> so anyway, he, 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 he really does great stuff. So with all that in mind. Now I truncated my remarks. Like I said, I could keep going with each one of these because they really are great people, great insight. But let's go to some questions here. I'm gonna start with Per here to start us off because I was just mentioning business worthy and we're here to talk about shared values and I wanna talk about shared values. But Per has spent a lot of time and he and I have had a lot of conversations over a concept that, that pivots off of or is inclusive of the notion of shared values but I really like the way that he frames it. And so I'm gonna ask him to talk a little bit about that. And then I'll ask our other panelists to just react to their notion of, of what, uh, what they think of when they think of the term of shared values or business worthiness. Perry, you wanna start off with just talking about your concept a bit? Thank you. Thank you for your kind words, too, too kind, I think. Now, um, uh, obviously, there's a link between the concept of being business worthy and the shared value uh, aspects. Uh, it both complements and in, in a fine way, I think it individualizes it. Um, 
obviously uh, reconnecting the links between business and the interest of society, creating values for, for all stakeholders has sort of becoming mainstream over the years. Uh, business worthy as a concept combines two elements, coining the combination of purpose and ethics. To see is sort of the core of it. The purpose is then about solving problems that create value and impact for all shareholders or, or all stakeholders, sorry. Uh, and combining this with emphasizing the ethical aspects, recognizing that we as human beings are naturally hardwired to be morally load bearing. So in that aspect is sort of uh, very much linked to reciprocity and all those aspects uh, that you find to be a key concept in, in, uh, in business. So business really is basically and simply and short said that ethically solving problems that create value for all, i.e. that's the idea of not profiting by producing problems, but help improving society. So it's, it's providing profitable solutions to the problems of people and planet, if you put it short. As, as some of, one of our honorees, Paul Pullman said, putting a, a twist to this, if you are not here to improve society as a business person, then why are you here? So I, I think that links it quite well and put it also because business where they also coins a mindset. And that's maybe the key point here uh, to change it from the ordinary I would say uh, shareholder su supremacy. And it potentially could be a norm or an ideal of being in business, something you could be as a person. We all know the concept of being credit worthy. All people uh, in business globally know that concept. That's about not losing other people's money. But being business worthy is about earning other people's trust. And that's not something you can buy. You need to earn it. And I think if you look upon it, if you are a doctor, you, you, you have a higher calling. If you are a teacher, you have a higher calling. If you, are a pre if, if you are a preacher, you obviously have a higher calling. But if you are a business person, are you only there to make money? I don't think so. I think we need to have an ideal of a sort of higher purpose. I think it was Goethe and Viktor Frankl who said that with reference to having an ideal. If we take man as he really is, we make him worse. But if we overestimate him, then we promote him to be what he really can be. And I think business people can be so much more than the old way of looking at it, at least for the, I would call it the Friedman doctrine over the last 60 years. So uh, I think also that the business worthy concept and mindset is, is quite relevant as it recognizes the increasing interdependency that were alluded to uh, in, the, in, the, in the start here. It reflects how you need to look at the complexities and, and increasing volatility that we are seeing globally, the many trends that accelerates simultaneously and makes it more complex. And it resonates on three levels simultaneously. It resonates on the individual level that I alluded to. It's, this is something you can be, you can't be shared value, but you can be business worthy. So it individualizes that kind of identity of being in business. Secondly, it, it obviously, because of what happening both with technology and the speed of acceleration in, in many of the bigger, long, longer term trends, it, it is relevant business wise. It has to do with how you can create uh, value solving problems together with society while acting ethically. But this also contributes to a better society because that's how business play around and, and, and play a role in, in society. So it's informing both mindset, culture, and strategic thinking. So I think that sort of maybe sums it up, Tim. Okay, very good. Thank you, Per. 
Uh, Alexander or Zahid, any, any comments on what you're seeing as the importance of shared values or business worthy from, from where you sit? Well, um, coming from uh, my role on a pharmaceutical board, it's uh, extremely important to take ethics and business worthiness as Pierre so eloquently um, coined this phrase and uh, explained it. It's become uh, more and more relevant uh, today because uh, things have become more transparent on a global level, level through social media, through a wider uh, pool of stakeholders, and everybody um, is entitled to and has access to having an informed opinion. So in, in terms of pharmaceutics, when we're dealing with people's lives, it's of the utmost importance that uh, ethics is at the forefront of everything that we do. And um, uh, in terms of research, in terms of developing drugs, in terms of patients, doctors, and um, NGOs, uh, governments, uh, everybody, uh, that um, that we we uphold this to the highest level. Okay, Nahi. Yeah, Tim. Well, first of all, it's a real privilege to be um, on this panel and part of this conversation. Um, you now, I enjoy these sessions because it's a chance to really learn and, and reflect. And spare. it's been great to hear uh, uh, more about the concept. I think it's a very powerful one. And I suppose I'd, I'd just make three observations um, from my own experience. Uh, so business fights property, you know, we're a global community of businesses and, and others who are interested in the role of business. And I think the first observation I make, uh, and I think this speaks to some of your references there, for example, to Viktor Frankl, is that behind all the big brands that we work with, are people and they are driven to have a higher calling and I think if you can get behind and beyond the brand whether it's an NGO or a government agency or a, a business it's about humans and I think when we come together as humans we certainly find that there really is um, uh, a real drive that people want to do something uh, that's positive for society so so I think that we can humanize business, then actually that really resonates the way you described uh, business worthiness. I think a second point is that the complexity of the issues that we're facing nowadays, um, I mean, just think about the interconnection between, say, the impact of the pandemic and deep-seated inequities like gender, race, geography, income. There are such complexities in how to deal with these systemic issues that we have to do them together. And that means business has to be at the table thinking about how they can bring their core business, their philanthropy, their voice to these issues. So I think, again, just the nature of the issues that we have, we face means business has to be there and thinking about um, how they can make a difference. And, and maybe the final thing I'd say is, is um, I, I, you might have seen the A1 Trust Barometer just came out, the 2022 version, and a couple of interesting things. One was um, people expect, and when I say people, that's employees, shareholders, investors, customers, expect business to do more. I think it was 52% feel business is not doing enough on climate, 49% not doing enough on inequality. And employees, I think it was um, something like 60% feel that they want their business to stand up on the issues they, they care about. And I think there's a certain expectation now, and maybe especially because of the pandemic, and also in the context now of climate, that business needs to be at the table. So I think these sorts of concepts around business uh, awareness, I think are really very current and important. Yeah, this is great. If I could add just one thing here, I'll be an active moderator here today, but I, I wanted to share an example. Actually, I mean, something that the pair had talked to me years ago was how business can be a model or a mechanism or the business model can be a mechanism to solve social problems. And so on one hand, there can be you know, philanthropic and stuff like that. And Alexander and I walked, wrote about this too, that, that business can be something that is solving problems. And the example, I just love this example. And I'm so proud of the example because it's one of my very favorite former students who's in the midst of it. Um, also going back around that time, about 2005, 2007, when she graduated from George Washington University, she went to become a a um, executive recruiter, a headhunter for quantitative traders on Wall Street. I mean, that's a pretty tough, elbow sharp job kind of a thing, you know. Um, but here about two, three years ago, she left that. Uh, she and her husband moved to California and she works for a startup now called The Mom Project. I think that this is just a cool project. I mean, it's a company, it's another recruiting company that intentionally sets out to try to match women who have been out of the workplace, usually for family reasons, 
who would like to get back in the workplace. They typically want to do it part time. They would like to do it from um, you know remote. But the, there are companies that are looking for people who are lawyers and accountants and whatever. So they need those skills, uh, th those skills. And in one sense, all they're doing is exploiting a, a, a you know, market failure of you know matching those people together. But they're doing it with a particular purpose. They're doing it with a gender empowerment kind of a purpose so that they are they're giving women the opportunity to succeed in the workplace and to have good jobs in the workplace. And, and so it is a way that the business model can be solving a social problem because there is a shared nature of how everybody ends up winning as a result of that. And so as we go through the conversation, I think it's good for us, not that any of you said this, but I mean, just for good for our audience to be thinking of, well, yeah, there's a way for business to be philanthropically active and stuff like that. But what is business doing? How do they do the business? How they do the business can make a difference or what they choose to, to the, the purpose that they choose can make a, can really make a change in, in, in because by utilizing shared values. Anyway, uh, I don't want to go out on, on this, but I just thought it's, 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 I think it's a good, good way to keep framing these kinds of issues. Anyway, we only got an hour. I need to keep going here. Um, and you don't want to hear me talk. You want to hear you talk. So um, next question I'm going to pose uh, to start off with Zahid. Been a tough couple of years, <laughs> uh, uh, for sure, with, with the pandemic and it's, it's affected everyone. Um, and so my question is, have you seen examples, you know, particularly in your last comment, you were talking about how the pandemic has, has exacerbated a lot of the inequities that are already existing in society. Have you seen examples of the implementation of shared values or business worthy during the pandemic? And, and how do you think the post pandemic environment could further shape those concepts and influence business decisions? Yeah, so I think you know, one of my favorite quotes is by uh, James um, Lane Allen, and, and, it's, and it's this, adversity does not build character, it reveals it. And I think one thing that we saw through the pandemic is it was very evident early on who the, who the fast first movers were amongst business to do something. Um, and same amongst business networks, and in fact, amongst everyone, you know, who were the companies that stood up and supported the most vulnerable um and who did it in a way that was really leveraging all of our assets and know-how um and we we saw some really great examples and often though they were driven by people who themselves were impacted by the pandemic so it was you know despite being everyone impacted i think people recognized pretty early on that of course the most vulnerable were most were the most impacted and, and thinking about how they could do something um, so we, uh, from our, for our part, we did some analysis uh, very early on with um, Jane Nelson, who you might know, who's the director of the Corporate Responsibility Initiative at Harvard Kennedy School. And she has a model which uh, I, I first came across in the mid 90s um, that really splits out the ways in which business can make a difference. Uh, and it is core business, it's philanthropy and policy advocacy or voice, which uh, you know, everyone's alluded to so far. And so you want to understand how a business using those three levers to support the lives, the livelihoods and access to learning of the most vulnerable. And there were some really, really interesting examples. I think just one, I just could give a couple maybe. AB InBev, the brewer, um, they very quickly repurposed their, um, their factories in Brazil using the non-alcoholic beer, or rather the alcohol from the non-alcoholic non beer to create hand sanitizer for hospitals. Um, and then more recently to create oxygen um, and, and supply the, the health system. So there was a business that very quickly innovated using their, their factories to, to make a difference. Um, another company, Unilever, uh, has done some really interesting work using their marketing know-how to shift um, behavior change around hand washing and hygiene um, and uh, have done some really interesting work. I, I was involved in some in, in, in Kenya, for example, where... Um, they managed to really um, improve access to, to um, messaging and, uh, and, and hygiene products and so on. So I think there are companies that right across that sort of matrix, if you like, of ways of getting involved have really lent into, uh, into this, um, this issue. I think in terms of the other part of your question, um, of, you know, where, do, where does this sort of leave us? I think there's a few things I think will, will come out or continue post-pandemic. One is I think it's become um, very clear 
that everyone has a role to play, whether it's using your knowledge, your networks, your resources. Um, and as a business um, and as individuals, you know, thinking about how you can make a difference um, can apply applies to everyone. And in fact, as I mentioned, the complexity of these issues means that we all have to be a leader in, in our own way. Um, and so I think there's a clarity that business has a role to play through those different levers. I'd say a second point that we were certainly very impressed by was the speed of partnerships, and whether it's obviously vaccine creation or whether it's around mobilizing to get oxygen to India or whatever it might be. It was incredible to see how quickly people had got together. And, and one uh, pharmaceutical company I was speaking to, they, they were talking about one of their partnerships that normally would take maybe two years was done in, in a couple of weeks. And I think having done that now, we, we realize that actually it's possible to do these partnerships in an agile, fast and quick way. So I think hopefully that speed will stay with us. Um, and maybe the third point is around um, impact and, and recognizing that there are ways, especially when we use our core business, that we can have a really big impact. Uh, and the, probably the key thing now is understanding how you better measure that and communicate the impact that you have. But but I think there's a, I think we've seen what's possible through the pandemic, and I think the sense of interconnectedness has has only strengthened that humanity that I mentioned at the beginning. The fact that you know we all have to be part of of, of this issue. Thank you, thank you, Alexander. Speaking of pharmaceuticals, you, you posed the question next to you in terms of uh, examples that you have seen during the pandemic and where it might lead us in the future. Yeah, I think uh, we've certainly lived through some very uh, exciting uh, and very unpredictable years. And I think that one of the most important pointers to come out of that is how important or um, what kind of a win-win situation one can get out of these times. And that has to be, for, for me definitely, uh, governments working with, uh, with um, industries and with uh, private businesses. So how we get the public sector to work more closely, more closely with private sectors um, we, we've seen that very much in um, providing uh, PPE equipment for, for frontline staff. We've seen that in um, the huge, uh, the, the very uh, quick development and rollout of uh, huge vaccine programs, all, all these sorts of things that, that wouldn't have been possible unless we, we had these, this um, uh, going hand in hand between public and private sectors. Uh, I think um, having said that, though, we've also seen during this, these pandemic times how a global crisis or issue or problem can um, make us all very localized uh, in that um, we've, looked to, we've looked to supporting our local communities, those who are most vulnerable in, in, um, in times of need. And um, we, we, we've also, um, it, it, from what I understand, it's been very difficult to, uh, to get um, people employed to actually move geographically, whereas now we don't need to. Most of us have learned to work from home. It's not a, it's not a big issue. Uh, and, and having done that, we've also helped uh, other um, issues that we've, we've also um, had a problem dealing with, such as environment. So with many of us working from home and not traveling so much, uh, um, looking to produce locally because it's been extremely difficult to get um, minerals or, 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 or pr products from other, uh, uh, other parts of the world, we've learned to look locally. And I think that's a good thing. And I think that one of the last things that I wanted to mention was, I, I think it's also allowed companies to look at their employees very much as individuals and uh, allow them to decide what's most important for them, i.e. working from home, having a better work-life balance, being there uh, as partners for each other and, and, and there for the children. Not always ideally, I know, but it's, it's given individ uh, employees more of a chance to um, um, uh, take over what, what, how, how they want to see as their, their working hours. It, it, flexibility has become quite an important word. All right, very good, thank you. Per, what are your thoughts on this topic? Yeah, I, I think there's been a number of unsung heroes in business uh, during the pandemic. Uh, so there's this huge amount of examples like uh, Sahid is, is, is alluding to. I think uh, also that we have uh, really seen uh, the interconnectedness, the, the interrelationship that we have and the need to have a balance between business and the interest of society and society as such. So the very thing that uh, 
this whole discussion is about has been proven very very pertinent because of the pandemic. It's, it's underlined that this is this is really something that is happening. At the same time, I I think it's fair to say that uh, it really has exacerbated the gaps in wealth values and politics globally as well. So it's not that just only on the on the, on the upside thing. It's it's become a lot of more of problems being more accentuated. But I, I think one one positive thing I. I I'd like to, to comment is that le leading to what just uh, Alexandra was saying that technology has really made a huge leap during this process. And in a way it has uh, uh, divorced the fact that you need to work, uh, you, you need to, to live where you work, but suddenly you can, uh, you can work where you live. And I think that's a pretty uh, big change. Uh, it's, it's, it's potentially a, a civilization change because that means that people from all around the world could uh, get into very interesting opportunities and jobs that they were not able to do before. Uh, the whole thing about urbanization and moving from the rural areas into city and the whole mega cities agglomeration aspects and the, and the issues around there. Suddenly technology came around and, and, and you could be where you live and still have an interesting job and maybe much more interesting than before. I think that's a key point that we've been seeing through the pandemic, which is very interesting to, 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 to follow up on. Can I build on? Yeah, please. Can I build on Pear's comment there? I think the other interesting thing we've seen through technology is, is the ability to bring in voices of those more proximate to the issues that we're talking about. And so just from our own case, you know, we used to run big events in New York and London and so on. Um, but you had to be in those places to come to the events and be on stage. Whereas now, um, you know, a recent event, 75% of our speakers are from the global south. Um, and 75% were women, 75% from black, Asian, and minority ethnic background. So you can in co-creating solutions to these issues, we can be much more inclusive using technology. And that's really been a lesson for us, I think, as an organization is how do we do that in a way that's much more uh, diverse and inclusive. So I think that's the, in addition to the working from anywhere, it's also speaking from anywhere, I think has become a really important um, so feature. This, this could be an accelerating force, what has happened because of the pandemic. I agree, yeah. Uh, just to just reflecting on some of these latter comments on technology and, and the flexibility that all of you have mentioned one way or the other. I've been teaching, this is my 37th year teaching, and I used to laugh in the first um, you know, eight or nine years that people in business schools didn't want to take an ethics course. I mean, that was just, you just didn't want to do that. And so I, I would have to do a song and dance. And those of you who know me know that I might literally do a song uh, in the class in order to uh, get people to think that this was a worthwhile course. But it was in the, in the, about the late 90s or so, it all changed with these because it wasn't the deans, it wasn't my fellow faculty members who thought that ethics and corporate responsibility was so important. It was the students who said a corporate indiscretion can be broadcast worldwide in five minutes because of these. What do we do about that? And so the interest came from the students because of technology that business suddenly became almost like a little, like my little hometown where I grew up of 800 people that were kind of everybody could kind of keep an eye on everything. And so you, you can go a little bit too far with that, but at the same time, there is an accountability. There's a way to observe that the people, that companies have to worry about their reputation in ways that they didn't necessarily, it's harder for them to get away with things than what they did before. Now, Technology has its downside. We all know that. I mean, social media has its plus and, and negatives too. But I think that you're all identifying a potential positive, both within the pandemic, as for those of you who are listening in, you know, one of the conversations we had before of the panelists before we started was how in the world would higher education have even existed if this had happened 10 years ago? And, and we do it fine now with, with Zoom and stuff like that. It's still not the same with actually being in there with the, the students, but you can do it. You, you, you can do it. And so I do think that this whole technology acceleration is going to have some real consequential changes, already has, and will continue to do so uh, as we have built in the flexibility the technology provides to us. 
Um, I think really interesting comments there. Um, we, we another question. I'm going to pose this one uh, to start off to, to Alexandra. Um, so you, there's there, there's a lot of focus these days on what's called ESG uh, kinds of investing, uh, environment, social, and government strategies. That you know, it's, it's investment funds that focus on that. Um, and so there's a lot of activity around. We want we like to see companies that are focused on being environmentally responsible, having a social conscience and, and governing in a way that is non-corrupt and is open and stuff like that. But kind of underneath that or within that is the notion of what kind of a culture do you need to have? What kind of a corporate culture do you need to develop? Or what's the optimal kinds of corporate culture? Or what are the components of a corporate culture that, that makes looking at business worthiness or shared values or ES and G. I mean, what, what's, the, what's the cultural link? And culture is crucial. And how did, what does it look like? I mean, what, is it, what are some of the dynamics or components of culture that we ought to be thinking of and companies ought to be thinking of? I think one of the most important uh, issues or points is that uh, as an employee, you want to be proud of the company that you work for. You want to be able to happily identify with it. You have to, it has to resonate with your own personal values, beliefs, and morals. And most importantly, I think that um, as, as an employee, as part of that company, you have to, first of all, know what your values and your morals uh, are. And once you've uh, identified them, then you, then you have to, uh, it, it, it's a two-way thing. The company has to uphold those uh, values and 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 you as a stakeholder um, have to as well. So uh, I think it's um, it's to challenge uh, when you when you go to work every every day to challenge uh, to speak up uh, if you if you see anything uh, that you you don't associate with or you think is wrong. I think it's important to have um, to have. Um, role models in a company and I think it's uh, crucial that the, the, the leaders of a company uh, not only are the role models but they uh, walk the talk it's enough it's not enough to just have codes of conduct and uh, codes of ethics and things like that but if, if they don't walk the talk then how can you expect that to, to roll on and filter down through the company um, we talked about reputation earlier how it's a uh, more important than any at any other time in history just by you pulling up your mobile and saying you know accountability is is there there's transparency uh just about you know everything that we do you every corner we turn there's a, 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 a reputation is is um of utmost uh, importance today because uh, everybody has a voice um, be it the uh, consumer or uh, the supplier or um, the the employee, you know, you name it. The stakeholder circle gets bigger and bigger, and and everybody feels that they have uh, an importance importance in it. So I think really it's 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 also um, honesty, transparency, and I, I know that I mean you've asked a very big question. So there are all sorts of there are many aspects to this, but I I do think as well that. It's really important for a company to, whatever it expects out of its employees, it has to equip its employees with. This means training your employees to be able to spot an ethical issue immediately. Because as we know, uh, in, in business, there are many gray ethical areas. It's not nearly as black and white as it is outside of business. And, and it's important to, tr to train your employees, to train, to train people to, to not only spot them, but to deal with them in the best possible way. Great, thank you. Per, do you want to take a shot at that? Absolutely. I, I think um, talking to culture, obviously, uh, I think all business culture should be business worthy, obviously. Now, that being said, um, home from the top, uh, role models, uh, having purpose, uh, and ethics um, inform the culture, uh, I think is key. Uh, maybe a way to look at it uh, is that it's, it's a three-way three model in which you could, on the way, one end, look at business as we usually do, as a like kind of a machine, a machine that uh, produces something and uh, scales and operates in a way 
uh, by contract said technically it's a machine doing something. That's sort of the way most of it have been over the last 50, 60 years. But there's two other perspectives um, or dimensions. Uh, you could call that the it, it dimension. Then you have the I dimension. Me as a person, as a human in that business. Who am I? Uh, what kind of uh, beliefs, purpose, values, culture do I bring to the table? That's another perspective coming in uh, besides the it perspectives. And then you have the we perspectives, which is all, all the, the dimension of all the relationship aspects, the, uh, uh, how we communicate, how we coordinate, what we do together. And so if, if you bring that tree edged uh, into the discussion, the it, the I, and the we, then certainly it, it, you are on a track to a more humane way of looking at what business is about culturally wise. Very good. Okay, thank you. Zahid? Yeah, you know, I, I just say I completely agree with what Pear was just saying. I think the when when I speak to business, in my experience, when I speak to business people, I haven't well, I haven't yet met a business person who says they're doing it for money or to make a profit. I so this is a high calling concept that Pear mentioned earlier. I think you know they're doing it because they want to tackle digital digital equity or to connect people or to create sustainable energy or whatever it is, but there's always something bigger than themselves and, and even than the company. And in terms of embedding purpose authentically into business, I think the real telltale sign for me is, well, two things. One is when it goes beyond the sustainability department or the CSR team, and we start to see it come up around the business and just becomes a way of talking. And, and related to that, when you see it starting to show up in procurement or in uh, marketing or wherever it might be, um, it starts to permeate the whole business. And I think there's a very powerful, it feels very powerful when you see that in action. Um, and I'm seeing more companies who are looking to do that um, and to articulate that much more clearly, to articulate what Pear has said, um, so that it, as, as, as Cassie Alexandra says, there's a sort of alignment between the personal um, self and the corporate self. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely seeing that that coming out quite, quite strongly now. Eric, you had a follow up? I have to one more point, which I think is, is quite relevant and, and interesting and, and, and timing wise, uh, also interesting. And uh, usually you say in business that uh, you can only manage what you can measure. The interesting thing now, uh, and increasingly, is that you can measure things that you couldn't measure before. So the, the impact of the consequences of your decisions can in increasingly and accelerating way being measured. And this I think is very important because this means that you, you go from a model investment wise where you, you balance risk and reward to a model where you balance risk, reward and impact. And you put that into an accounting system and that's sort of what's happening as we speak. And, and this basically means that if you optimize a business only for profit, you take a huge risk because there's so much data coming align that you can measure. So if you don't uh, make a decision based on that data, you, you're only uh, another person with an opinion. But when you know what's happening, because when you take an investment decision, it's not such that that investment decision ends by the financial returns you get. There's a lot of things that happens when that decision is taken. And, and before you, you, you couldn't really measure it. It was just sort of some wishy-washy and then you turn that to something which is concrete, but now you can. And it becomes uh, stock exchange relevant, those aspects. So, so it gives an investor and thus a decision maker in business a lot more information uh, to make much better decisions and optimize them for much more than just profit. You could use a whole dimension of variables that you can optimize and balance. I think this is key. So technology comes along here in an increasingly interesting way. Great, thank you. So um, we're, we're, we're not even through all the questions that um, we had proposed that we'd be talking about, but it is also, uh, we only have nine minutes to go. And Tim Smith, I'm going to be, um, I'm cold calling you here a little bit that I think that 
we'd like to have a, a little bit of time to uh, have Q and A if people had questions they can feed. Uh, Tim, why don't you, can you explain to me how they should go about doing this and, and feed them so we can get to any questions that people might have? Of course, thank you, Tim. And thank you to our audience for joining us today. Please submit your questions through Q&A and we'd be glad to send those through to the panelists. I'll send those right directly to you, Tim. Uh, I think that's it, thanks. Okay, all right. While we're while you're all uh, gearing up to to send those, I just had a kind of a follow up comment on some of these last conversations, um, in terms of culture. Uh, one is you know, Alexandra's in my book is in, entitled "The Sincerity Edge," and one of the paradoxes that we were looking at is that one reason to trust a company or an individual is because there's a pretty good likelihood that it'll pay off. It's kind of like karma, that if you do good things, that people will think better of you and your employees will stay or your customers will continue to return. And I don't have a problem with that. I think that when that happens, there's actually a good feedback mechanism so that we're rewarding the things that we want to reward. And I'm, all, I'm, I'm completely fine with that. But one might trust another person if they're doing it for more sincere reasons that they just think that it's a good thing to do, in addition to the fact that it might be instrumentally beneficial to them. And so if you're dealing with someone because they're, they're, they're nice to me, they're good to me because uh, I can get even with them or because it's going to pay off, well, okay, yeah, that's all right. But I believe that person because they really think that the environment is important, that enhances the, the believability and the trustworthiness that they have. And so paradoxically, <clears throat> you may have more payoff if you're doing it for reasons that aren't associated with the payoff. Um, and that paradox, I think, plays directly into what we were talking, have been talking about in terms of shared values and business worthiness. That if, if people believe that these values, these societal values are important, then that enhances the reputation of the company as they try to pursue them. And it's a little bit of paradoxical, but I think that there's a truth in paradox often. And I think this is one of those that, that businesses can think about. And I think where it push, where it really gets identified is Alexander and I did a, a survey of 20 CEOs, half from Northern Europe and half from North America, of what they think is necessary in order to run or to develop an ethical culture. And one of the things that they mentioned was to continue your values, even if it seemed like it was going to cost you something. <clears throat> so that, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, when push comes to shove, you can say all the wonderful things that you want to say of how you're going to be responsible and concerned about the environment and all these kind of things. But if, when push comes to shove and you're, you're, you're confronted by it, do you still hold to the values or do you sell out the values in order to get the profit? And that's when you show the sincerity. The classic example of that is, you know, and it's, it's dated and it's sad that we're still using this example because it's so dated, but it's the classic Johnson, Johnson & Johnson Tylenol case uh, where it was risky for them to pull Tylenol off the shelves worldwide. Um, wasn't that an admission of guilt? Didn't, were they admitting they did something wrong? But Jim Burke, the CEO said afterward, we couldn't live up to our value statement, our mission statement. Well, who pays attention to some silly thing like a value statement? They did. That's not to deify Johnson & Johnson. I'm not saying they do anything right. But they did then because they were sincerely pursuing those values and they meant something to them. And when people saw that they were doing it, it was a brilliant strategic move because then people say, hey, they're really taking this seriously. And so there's a paradox here that I think of that is a play that, that can make a difference in companies as well. Uh, Tim, I don't know if we have any questions as I was was talking there, but if if not, if any of our if you do forward them along, if not, if any panelists have any fine, oh, here we do have a question. Um, question is, um, I certainly agree and believe that we have seen a glimpse of what is possible: additional business worthiness being displayed, heightened trust and culture during this time of disruption. How do we now build on the created momentum and not simply return to the status quo? Any thoughts anybody would like to, to share on that? How do, we, how do we build on the momentum and not just go back to things as they were before? Go ahead, Per. I, I think uh, we will not go back. I think the, the, the evolution will go north. 
uh, and I think the reason is is the interconnectedness and technology, and the fact that you can measure, and when you can measure, the investors and the pension funds of the world won't give you money unless you are able to optimize in a better way than just profit, because profits is not enough to get a good living for self as pensioners. So I think I don't think it's about whether this will happen. It's about the speed. And I think what uh, we on the panel are agreeing on that we need to help accelerate that speed. Anyone else that wants to weigh in on that? There's an interesting context to this as well. You, you've mentioned trust a few times, Tim. Um, the the eight one trust promise that I mentioned at the beginning um, found that 77% of employees say they would trust their employer. Uh, that compares to only 50% trust in the media. So we're in a context where with technology, there's lots of fake news, whether it's around COVID or whatever, the climate, uh, that actually employers have a responsibility because they are trusted in relative terms, even compared to NGOs, government and media. So I think um, there's there's a important um, opportunity, but also responsibility for business to step in and help drive forward wider change that's positive for people and, and for planet because people expect them to. And, and um, you know, so I think that that's that genie's at the bottle now in a way, you know, and, and um, business has been given a, you know, sort of a, a call out, they need to do something more in this space. Alexander, you want to have the final word on this? Yeah, I think um, businesses uh, do tend to be first movers. We know that in terms of laws and regulations that often come on the on the back of businesses moving first. Uh, I, I, I certainly agree with my fellow panelists that I don't think that I, I think that there are many things that are here to stay now. I think that um, measurability is, 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 is plays certainly a big part and uh, um, I think accountability is there once we measure and, and are, are able to hold uphold businesses and compare them against each other. And um, also as stakeholders, make sure that we, we support uh, the, the, the companies that are business worthy and leave the ones who are not behind. Very good, thank you. Well, we're pretty well at the end of our time here today. And I wanted to thank all of our panelists, Alexandra, Per, and Zahid for their time. It, like I said at the beginning, it's a real treat for me to have all these folks together. And I'm sure that any of you who have been watching in live in person here over the last hour would agree with that. And I hope that those of you who are watching a recording of this uh, have, are finding this very useful and, and, um, uh, and thoughtful. And certainly, if you have uh, any follow-up questions, I believe that, that Tim and Levon have a mechanism for you to send those along so that we could distribute them or to provide responses to them. Um, this is a great topic. It's an important topic. It's 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 a timely topic at any time, but it's a particularly one so given what we have been going through and are going to be continuing to go through. And so I thank the panelists again for all their time and their insights. And I thank uh, the Institute for International Business for sponsoring this. Um, thank you all. And Tim, I don't know if you have any final things to sign us off here, but I think that for us, we're good. Well, great. Uh, I also want to thank each of you. What a pleasure, Alexandra, Zahid, and Pear. Thank you so much. Uh, it's an exciting time, and thank you for your excellent thinking, and thank you so much for your participation. I look forward to the next discussion. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you very you much, much, everybody.